This is part two of study that we started last Wednesday night, and we entitled it Marketing and Merchandising the Ministry. We were uh, trying to address some of the so-called contemporary ways of outreach, and uh, some of which are legitimate, most of which are not. But uh, one of the reasons that we said that they are wrong is because they have taken secular or modern ways of advertising uh, and taken it to an extreme in an attempt to get people, uh, in an attempt to make uh, gain personally or financially. But the Lord Jesus Christ and several other uh, gospel uh, writers or Bible writers uh, have some things to say about that. We're going to look at it in the form of three principles. And the principle number one is God's house is not to be a place for merchandising. Now we're in John chapter 2, verse number 13. We left off here, but be good to just remind ourselves of what the Lord himself did. The Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, Passover uh, is one of the three mandatory feast days. You have Passover, uh, you have uh, the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, and uh, then you have uh, uh, the, uh, the one in the seventh month around the Day of Atonement. And all three of these are mandatory feast days where every Jewish male has to come to Jerusalem uh, in order to offer sacrifices. Now the thing is, for many, especially at this time, it was a pilgrimage. Uh, you had to plan your journey because it wasn't just like hopping in your car, going down to the, to the local church that you belong to. Uh, if you were out of country, you still had to go there if you wanted to keep up with, um, uh, with the uh, protocol, with what was required, the policies and the like. So, one thing you didn't do then, if you were traveling a long distance, is bring along your oxen and your turtle doves and so forth. So when you got to Jerusalem, uh, what was one of the things that you had to have? Well, you had to offer certain things to, in the temple. So the um, people here uh, found a way to gouge these uh, folks uh, to, to make a quick buck. So he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. Now the changers of money uh, were those who would take the coins from the Roman Empire, the Roman Mint, and exchange them for other type coins. And the reason being, what did they have on the Roman coins? A picture of Caesar. Well, Caesar, of course, was worshipped as a god. And so that was an image or an idol of another god on that coin. And so the Jews that lived in the Roman territories would come with their money and they would exchange it for other coins so that they could put it in the, the collection. Uh, Lord only knows uh, what, uh, what, what they were thinking here because these guys had to do something with those coins. Uh, they did do something with it. They made a good living out of it uh, uh, because they were gouging these folks. So the m money changers. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, uh, along with the animals, poured out the money changers' uh, uh, money, and overthrew the tables. And this is what he said. Take these things hence. Now, it's not that they were not part of temple worship. Every single animal was, and the, uh, the money was, the giving of money, the tithes and the offerings, and so forth. There was redemption money. There was, there was silver to be... Uh, uh, taken in as well. But what they were doing was having these things there so that they could mark it up, uh, so that they could gouge the people. They were mandated by God and necessary, and these people knew it, and so therefore they would really um, bring up uh, the, uh, the re retail or profit on it. And so it says, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. For it is written, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. Now, Jesus Christ himself got excited. He got angry. He got mad because of merchandising or marketing in the Father's house. Now, if you'll turn back with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 56. <clears throat> Isaiah, chapter 56.
Now, there are several Old Testament portions that we'll look at that address what was happening in the Father's house or the temple in the days of Christ. Verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment, do justice, for my salvation is near, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that does this, the son of man that lays hold on it. Now note, that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it, keepeth his hand from doing evil. Now what they were doing, and he's going to lead up to this uh, in a minute, was absolute evil. Uh, in, in our definition of it, the best of life apart from God, uh, they, they were leaving God out of the picture because God did not say for them to do this. Uh, having a service, having a provision for these people that are, that are out-of-towners, that's one thing. But to have it so that they could make personal gain off of what God said, you've got to offer these sacrifices, you've got to give this money, uh, was, uh, was totally out of line. Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs, that keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Now, obviously, the, uh, the uh, picture here is that God is a merciful God and a loving God, and he is making provision even for folks who are uh, not, as it were, linked to the covenant. Obviously, a eunuch is not. Uh, they had their sex organs removed, uh, uh, as it were. They could not have the mark of circumcision. And so the eunuch says, well, I can't have a part. And God said, no, wait a second. I'm going to make provision for you. It, you're going to keep my Sabbath. You're going to keep my covenant. You're going to come to my house. And, uh, and you really want me? Forget the mark. Uh, it's the heart intent that I really want. And so he made provision for them. The same thing with the stranger or the Gentile. Uh, Thus says the Lord to the eunuchs, they keep my Sabbath and choose those things that please me and take hold of my covenant, even they don't, though they don't have the mark of the covenant. Even to them will I give in mine house, in the temple, and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. They can't have children, but they can still have a name with God that will last forever because of their heart uh, and their attitude. I'll give them an everlasting name, and it shall not be cut off. Uh, and again, that's, that's sort of a, a, a play on words there as to what happened to them. But verse 6, the sons of the strangers that joined themselves to the Lord. Okay, here are Gentiles that went through the process of circumcision, and, and even though they weren't born into the uh, family of Israel, they're still going to have a part. Why did they join the Lord? To serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Every one of the Gentiles uh, that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of the covenant. You see, here are people, and you'll excuse the phrase, that were sincere, or better yet, genuine in their worship, even though they had some things going against them. God said, I'm, I'm not going to turn you away. I'm going to bring you into this house, my house. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on mine altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer uh, for all people. And the Lord is going to gather the outcasts of Israel and so forth uh, and, uh, and, and bring them in. However, note starting at verse number 10. His watchmen. Now the watchmen were those that were taking care of the temple. The priests, the Levites, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, that should take care of the temple. To do what? Well, so that the Sabbath would not be polluted, so the temple worship would not be corrupted. They were his, and he's going to, he's going to use the word dog here, they were his watchdogs. The watchmen are blind. They're all ignorant. Now, why were they blind? It's because they looked the other way, uh, uh, because eventually some of this would be graft that would grace their palms. 
So this would be money that would come. There. So instead of the priest, uh, uh, instead of the priest saying, "We're not going to have it. We're going to keep the, this church pure, and we're going to worship the Lord and honor Him totally. We're not going to have this markup, as it were, and this selling of the goods." All these merchants were given a kickback to the priest, the watchman of the house, that should have said something, but they didn't. They turned and they were they turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to him because they were getting part of the money back. They're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Now, <laughs> there, we have folks here that, uh, that have, uh, have dogs, and you come up to, to their house, and what's the first thing to greet you? It's snarl, snarl, bark, bark, and lets the owner know that there are strangers uh, approaching. But uh, here, they did not bark. They could not bark. Why? Because they would be telling on themselves <laughs> Uh, the, the watchdog, the thief is coming, they'd be telling on themselves so they can't bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber, they're greedy dogs which can never have enough. They're shepherds that cannot understand. You don't fleece the sheep, you feed the sheep. And their whole, quote, ministry was a fleecing the sheep. They could care less about their spiritual benefit and good eternal welfare. All they cared about was the money that would come pouring in around the festivals of Jehovah each and every year and how rich they'd get off these things. They all looked to their own way, everyone for his gain uh, from his uh, uh, quarter. They would say, come ye, I will fetch wine, we'll fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow is going to be as today, but much more abundant. Hey, this is just a Sabbath. Wait, wait until we get the festivals of Jehovah. We'll really make a killing then. All right, turn with me to um, Jeremiah chapter 7. So it was predicted that the Messiah was going to get upset over these people. Um, because it was predicted just exactly what these people were uh, would do. And that is, they would merchandise the house of God. Word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, verse 1. Stand in the gate of the house of the Lord and proclaim, Hear ye the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah that enter in these gates. Again, we're at the temple. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Amend your ways and your doings, and I'll cause you to dwell in this place. Now, they were not conforming to the strict policies for temple worship. And that's what Christ was um, uh, doing when he kicked them all out. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Now, you, what they were doing was saying, This is how we're supposed to worship. Uh, nothing wrong with this. This is how it's supposed to be. And that's what's uh, uh, being said here. The temple of the Lord, this is how you're, you're supposed to worship. Now remember, uh, the Apostle Paul addressed this when he told Grace Age pastors that there would be a twofold uh, onslaught against a local assembly. There would be those from within the church that would go out and draw away disciples after them. And again, uh, herding the flock uh, and, uh, and the sheep, having less sheep and the like. But then there would be those that would come in the, the church that would be wolves in sheep clothing. They looked like sheep, they bleated like sheep, uh, uh, they, uh, they were part of the flock like sheep, but in actuality they, they wanted to change the characteristic of the church. And so that's what these guys were doing. Uh, the church is this way and not this way. I know this is what the Bible says, but we've got to make it this way if we're ever going to appeal to people or get these people. So the temple of the Lord is these. If you thoroughly uh, amend your ways and your doings, you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor and don't oppress uh, and so forth, Verse 7, then I'll cause you to dwell in the place in this land and, get, and give it to your fathers and a name forever. Uh, behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. You'll steal and murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense to Baal and so forth. And then come, verse number 10, and stand before me in this house. Something's wrong here. You're making a mint off, off this house, and then you're going out and breaking all the commandments, and worse yet, you're giving some of this money to other gods. And they did. Uh, 
and, you, and say then, we are delivered to do all these abominations. In other words, no, nobody's going to uh, tell. We're safe. We're in control. We have the power, and no one can overthrow us. In this house, which is called by my name, has become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to the wickedness of Israel. Now, we're going to do that here in just a little bit. But um, it even says now in verse number 16, Because of this, therefore pray not for this people, neither lift up cry nor pray for them, neither make intercession for them, for I will not hear thee. Now, what did he do by reminding these people of Shiloh? Let's go to Psalms 78. Before the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle went to Jerusalem, the first place that it was set up historically in the land was at Shiloh. So they set it up and they had uh, virtually uh, temple worship there at uh, Shiloh in the form of the tabernacle. Uh, the temple is just a, a greater, more ornate form of, of tabernacle worship. So they had their priests there, and the high priest, his uh, name is Eli, and we'll look at him in, in just a little bit. Uh, but um, they lost the Ark of the Covenant in Shiloh. And uh, here we have Psalm 78, verse number 56. Now, where they're in the land, he says, they set up the temple, yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not his testimonies, and turned back and dwelt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a, a deceitful bow. Uh, having one who liked bows and arrows when he grew up, I understand what a deceitful bow is. Deceitful bow is one that looks like it shoots a straight arrow, but it, it always tends to make those things go the other way. It's deceitful in that it will not shoot straight. Uh, it, uh, uh, when, you, when you pull it back, uh, it, it has a, a quirk, a flaw in it, and it will not shoot straight. Uh, they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, he was angry and greatly abhorred Israel. So that, now here's the thing, he forsook the tabernacle at Shiloh. Now, that's, what, that's what's happening here, what Jesus is trying to correct. Uh, God, uh, his presence, his power, uh, his, even his pleasure in the people of Israel, in the temple, in all that they were doing for him and the worship and so forth, was totally unacceptable because nothing was right. They had corrupted the whole system. And so he reminds them, look, um, this is what you're doing. You better go back to Shiloh and remember what I did. What did he do there? He forsook the tabernacle. He will forsake the temple if things aren't made right in the house of God. And it's the same thing in dispensation of grace. Uh, the tent which he placed among men. He delivered his strength into captivity and his glory to the enemy's hands. All right, so let's go back then to 1 Samuel chapter 4. If anybody has ever read uh, uh, the book, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, or heard the story, you are familiar with the uh, foremost character in that story, Ichabod Crane. Now, Ichabod Crane uh, got his name from the Bible, and it is not a good name to have. And here's more or less what happened. We're going to, um, for the sake of time, come to uh, the verse uh, uh, 21 here in just a little bit, but uh, I will give you the upshot of this rather than reading the whole chapter. The ark of the Lord was in Shiloh. As long as Israel had the ark of the Lord and God commanded, they were pretty well assured of victory over their enemies. But uh, they, God was forsaking them, and uh, the Philistines came and set up an army against them and, and uh, just whipped them good in one of the battles. And so somebody got the bright idea, let's go to Shiloh and remove the Ark of the Covenant from the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, 
and let's parade it in front of the people. And so they did that. And all the soldiers, they were just whooping it up, you know. And the Philistines said, man, remember, these are the, this, these are the gods, you know, that they saw, seeing the ark. That represents the gods that took these people out of, out of um, Egypt and ha has uh, whipped all of these armies up to this point. They got scared. And somebody else said, hey, wait one second. Our gods are greater than their gods, and let's attack them. And so they did. And the upshot is they attacked them and they got the Ark of the Covenant. The Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant and put it in the, the temple of their god, Dagon. Now this is uh, one of the gods that uh, Samson fought uh, and uh, uh, they were uh, uh, fighting there. And anyway, um, let's, let's go ooh, verse number uh, 12. There ran a man. A Benjamin out of the army came to Shiloh. The same came with his clothes rent and the earth upon his head. When he came low, Eli sat upon the seat in the wayside, saying, For his heart trembled for the ark of God. And it should. Uh, his, his whole duty was to protect that ark, to care for the ark, to serve, service that ark, and to make sure that the ark was in its place because that ark represented everything uh, in a relationship between God and Israel. And uh, he was sitting there in the wayside watching for the ark. The man came into the city and told, uh, and told it. All the city cried out. And Eli heard the noise of the crying. What means the noise of this tumult? The man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old. His eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he that came out of the army. I fled uh, more or less to tell you what was done. What is it? He said, the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. There has also been a great slaughter among the people. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. Now, mind you, there's no great waste here. Hophni and Phinehas were corrupt priests, even though they were uh, in the temple. They were absolutely corrupt priests uh, as far as um, uh, uh, God was concerned. And Eli wouldn't restrain them. Uh, Eli was supposed to say, fellas, we're not going to do it that way. But he would let his sons get away with murder, as it were, and, and all sorts of other things. And so God ended up killing them. But here's the thing. The ark of God is taken. The presence of God is removed from the tabernacle. That's why he's telling them, remember what happened in Shiloh, because it's going to happen again. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck broke, and he died. For he was old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel 40 years. So uh, there it goes. Uh, Eli is dead. But now here's uh, what happened. He has um, his daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child, and she's about to be delivered. Finally, it, she delivered in verse 21. She named the child Ichabod. Now, this is how this name came to be. And it is a name associated with Shiloh and the, the abandoning by God of the tabernacle, saying, the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken. And she said, the glory is departed, verse 22, for the ark is taken. Now, this is why when Jesus Christ came in, he said, you're making my house a house of merchandise. These things should not be. Uh, and the Old Testament predicted it. And he reminds them of a historical incident uh, where God absolutely left, forsook his ministry. All right, let's go to a second principle here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9. The second principle is, not only should God's house not be a place for merchandising, as we have read, but secondly, the gospel itself should be without charge. That's why when we witness to somebody, and we give them books and literature and tracts and, and so forth, we, we don't say like the Jehovah's Witnesses, these cost money. <laughs> 
I've, I've been witnessed to several times by Jehovah Witnesses where they said, would you like to buy these books and so forth? And that is wrong, absolutely wrong. The gospel should be without charge. Uh, it is given as a gift. It is given freely by God. And therefore, in our ministry, when we're trying to reach the lost, we don't have them to buy uh, the, the very good news that will save their soul. Note uh, verse number uh, 18 of 1 Corinthians 9, where it says, What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. He could have charged for it, but that would have been merchandising. But the fact of the matter is, because everything about the gospel is free from the heart of God, he gives it as a loving gift, therefore we cannot put a price tag on it. As a matter of fact, if you'll read Romans, the Apostle Paul says, we owe the world the gospel. We owe a debt to the world that needs to be paid in telling them something that God has done for them freely by grace. And so these, these ministries that go out and begin marketing, merchandising, and so forth, uh, when it comes to the gospel, that it's, that's not what you're supposed to do. The gospel should be without charge. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Now you're going to say, well, Pastor, then this coming Sunday we won't take up a collection. Wrong. <laughs> The reason being is that there is an area of our lives where we share the provisions of God back uh, to the ministry so that the gospel can be free to others. Uh, they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Those that benefit in spiritual things from like a pastor teacher share in the carnal things or the material things like money to, to help uh, uh, keep him alive and keep the wolf from his door and, and so forth. Uh, so you have to understand what we're talking about here. But even then, uh, you, don't, you don't ever see here you know, these sob stories, you know, and, and trying to beg for money and trying to manipulate and twist arms and coerce and so forth to get people to give. It's a, it's a grace basis. Yes, giving is a part. Yes, there's, there's percentages. Yes, and, and so forth. But on the other hand, uh, there's, it's all grace uh, giving. It's, this is what God says. Your heart should respond in obedience to, uh, to him. We don't use any manipulative tactics to get them into your wallet or purse. Now, verse number 17, 2 Corinthians 2. And it says, we are not as many. Apostle Paul didn't live in our day, but he could have. This is our contention that if you take the money out of the ministry, that these, uh, these boys would be busy doing something other. You know, if persecution swept through the church in the United States of America, and all of a sudden you had to, uh, you paid a price, a real price for standing for the Lord, then all of a sudden we're going to find these guys uh, doing something else with their lives rather than the so-called ministry. We're not as many. I'd like to put in there we're not like as most which corrupt the word of God. Now you say, Pastor, wait one second here. Yeah, he's talking about twisting the scriptures, making them say something that, uh, that they don't say. Uh-uh. That's another word in the Greek. Poor translation in the King James. It is the word kapelio, the word corrupt there. And that word means, for, for an, an illustration you'll be familiar with, to water down the whiskey. Now, what uh, what did the? <laughs> that's what it means. Water down the whiskey. To uh, that, that's the best illustration. And it just so it just so happened that, you know, they've played the, this this thing outlaw Josie Wales on TV now. I'm probably three billion times, and I am not evangelistically speaking. 
But uh, it's one of the best Westerns, if you've ever seen it. It's a very good Western, and I, like, and I just happened to flip it on just to, just to relax before uh, going to sleep and so forth. And it came on the part where the Indians were coming up there, and they're at a trading post. And there were some of these other traders in, and he was uh, trying to sell whiskey, you know, and so forth. And these traders said, I don't want any of that watered-down stuff you're selling to them Indians. Now, what? He'd take a, a bottle, an empty bottle of whiskey and pour a little of it and pour a little water in there so that you still get the taste of whiskey and you'll eventually get the effect, but you have to drink a lot. And you're full. they're paying for a full bottle of pure whiskey, uh, but instead he's watered it down. So what has he done? He's made a little gain on it by just putting water in it, you know. He, he's, uh, he's made some gain, and that's what it is. It is to corrupt the word means to retail it. Uh, and, but yet not make it in its purity because uh, as soon as you make it in its purity, no one's going to want it anyway. So it, the corruption there is that you're watering it down to retail it to make more on, uh, on your sale. And that's what that word actually is. It's, it gives a different uh, connotation in the English translation. But that is the word. To adulterate a commodity, uh, to lessen its value, but to up the price on it. So you make more profit. We are not as many which merchandise the word of God is what Paul is saying here. But as of sincerity, genuineness in the heart, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Uh, in, in other words, uh, they realize that, that God is watching them and uh, that they need to keep their hands out of the till and that they need to keep the gospel free, and they also need to keep the gospel pure as well as their own motives. And we're not as many that market the word for a profit. Now, uh, we had a good illustration of that with um, uh, the um, Ben Houghtons. Uh, yes, they did sell things, but they, it was not out of reason or out of line. And what they do in the sale of their tapes is what? put it back into the ministry to, you know, keep on the road so that they can go singing and speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's, that's one thing. But it's another thing, uh, and we have uh, had lots of examples. Uh, take Jim Baker. Uh, he, he definitely merchandised and marketed the word so that he had not just hundreds of thousands of dollars, but millions and millions of dollars to build this college, to take uh, this conference center, to build a theme park that, that uh, was uh, similar at the time to that of Disney World. He had all of that money and uh, ended up uh, doing what he did anyway. But the, the point is, he wasn't in it for a calling. He was in it to capitalize on it for money. What does Paul say? Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And verse number 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, says the Apostle Paul. It's not that uh, he did not uh, appreciate people supporting him, and he took their support, yes. But the reason that he was in it was because God had called him to this ministry and because he realized that, um, uh, that souls were out there needed to be say, uh, saved, and he had to do it. So what does he say at the last part? I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, the spiritual benefit and welfare of many, that they might be saved. Okay, let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians then. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And here's the third principle. First principle is if there is indeed a church, a place that is called the house of God and that's legitimate, it should not be used for the purpose of merchandising. 
uh, that of forcing people to, to give, uh, to give more than uh, what they should, to, to give beyond their means uh, uh, in, a, um, in a, a coercive type deal. The second thing is we need to realize that when we preach the gospel, it is as free when we give it as it is when God offers it from the cross of Jesus Christ. It's free. It's a gift. And therefore, we don't cause people to have to, to pay us or buy anything from us for us to tell them the gospel. And that's part of our sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ. We work so we can give so that we can give freely this gift to people. And the last principle then is that the ministry is to be free of gimmicks or manipulative tactics. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 2. We have renounced. In other words, the Apostle Paul, and, and actually it's, um, it's a public thing. We're not going to do that. You know, we, we say here, we're not going to put this into effect. We're not going to do this. Uh, and we say it publicly because... They are hidden things of dishonesty. There is an ulterior motive. There's something uh, secretive about it, which is what the uh, people at the temple had. Uh, no one knew, and yet uh, they all pretty well knew, that, uh, that there was a flow of money that was being skimmed off the top from all of these sacrifices in this uh, merchandising uh, uh, ploy that they had there in the temple. And so the Apostle Paul says, we have renounced that sort of thing. Publicly we say, look, our hands are clean and pure. They're not in the till. We don't, uh, we take, don't take more than what is uh, offered and so forth. Hidden things of dishonesty. The whole kit and caboodle in the temple in the time of Christ, they were dishonest. They were there simply for monetary gain and not for the spiritual benefit of others. Uh, let alone the worship of God. We don't walk in craftiness. So this is part of our point. No, no gimmicks, no manipulation. In other words, uh, we more or less say, uh, and I'm using our church here, we, we say what the money is going to be used for. We say what we're going to spend it for. Uh, we uh, uh, don't have any... Uh, uh, underhanded or under the table dealings, uh, not walking in craftiness, so that when people give their money, they know that that money is going to go for this, that, and the other in a ministry to keep the lights on, fine, to pay the insurance, fine, uh, to have something printed, that's fine, uh, to keep up with the, all of the aspects of the ministry. Uh, but when they give, uh, it, is, uh, it is given in the, in the sense that it is from the heart and out of a heart of love for God and grace. You don't have to have a gimmick to get people to give. We have renounced gimmicks. We don't walk in craftiness. Oh, if we just do this, we'll get to milk them just a little bit more of their money. Not handling the word of God deceitfully. Not trying to make it say something. Well, the word of God says that you need to be giving 50%. You know, oh, the word of God. It, it's not doing that to try to get more money from people. It is to represent and reflect honestly what God has said regarding giving. Uh, so that we do not merchandise the ministry. But we tell folks flat out their responsibility from the scriptures and not uh, from some uh, uh, convoluted ideas of men just simply to get more money. No gimmicks, no manipulation. You don't use psychology. Uh, you don't tell tearjerker stories and, and, uh, and so forth. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We're, we're not doing it wrong, says the Apostle Paul. Now, why does he go into it, this big to-do with regard to the ministry? Well, because of what the ministry basically is. Let's turn to the book of Romans, chapter 10, or the remaining time we have. There have been uh, times uh, in our ministry here where 
you know, from time to time have had to explain why we don't do what other churches do. And the reason being is because of our studies. And we keep building study upon study, and we realize what they're doing in their manipulations, and that we're not supposed to do that. Volition is supposed to be free. Therefore, what we do as far as ministry is concerned is simply proclaim the word. If you use a gimmick, you are, you are uh, manipulating somebody's volition. You're trying to get them to do something or give something apart from the truth. And the, as soon as you do that, you're on dangerous ground. Because their decision is not going to be made because of the truth, but because of some other reason. And unless they, they respond to the truth, they're not saved. All right? Romans chapter 10. And we'll start with verse number 12. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So this is the principle. We don't use psychology on people. We don't try to get them to do anything but respond to the pure truth that is given. Now we're using the, the gospel, but it, it has to do with, um, with all doctrine from that point on. We don't try to mess with their minds, to use a, a current phrase. Uh, we don't try, try to twist their arms. We don't try to lead them w one direction as the neo-evangelical. Let's appeal to the flesh, and then once we get them, let, let's sneak up on them with the gospel. Huh? -uh. That's all manipulation. Those are all gimmicks, the entrapments, snares, and so forth. You cannot do that. They must be free in their volition to respond to the pure truth. So, Paul says, same Lord over all is rich to all that call upon him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord uh, shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? What is the ministry? It is you and me proclaiming to others the simplicity of the gospel. Now, hold your place here, and let's look at it at 1 Corinthians 15. How did the Corinthians get saved? What did Paul do? In each and every case, we're not going to have time tonight, but we will sometime later on. But in each and every case in his missionary journeys, when he went into a city, what did he do? preached. He proclaimed. He said, this is the way, walk ye in it. And he included these, um, these points. Moreover, brethren, verse 1 of 15 in 1 Corinthians, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached to you. Get it? I, I, I didn't, uh, uh, you know, try to, to, to lead you astray in any other way. I had no ulterior motives. I, I didn't, you know, I took the veil uh, off of my light so that you could see the pure light. I preached to you, which also you have received wherein you stand. If you keep in memory of what I preached, lest you believed in vain, I delivered unto you, first of all, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He is buried and he arose the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel that he preached. Uh, and that's what they were res uh, to respond to. That's how they were saved. If they believed or were uh, manipulated in any other way, they would not have been saved. If they believed in some other thing, or if he tricked them into making some sort of profession, which they really didn't mean on the inside, it, it's not real. It doesn't take effect. So let's. I'm getting a little excited here. My time's running out. Don't want to go down these trails, but how shall they preach then except uh, they be sent? And that's, this is how faith comes, and this is why we do things in a certain way. We read a lot of scripture. We, we compare scripture with scripture. We build doctrine upon doctrine. We categorize. We compare these things. We, we weigh and see uh, both sides. But the main point is, verse number 17, 
The ministry has to be free of gimmicks, uh, psychology, any other type of manipulations at all because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and that, uh, and that we are saved, verse number 13, by calling on the name of the Lord. So a clear, a pure uh, presentation of the gospel must be made free of anything else so that they might um, respond and be saved. So well, that concludes. I've got the red light. Why we need to be careful in our approach to, to outreach because we are not allowed to market or merchandise the ministry. Well, I could put another M in there. Market, merchandise, manipulate the ministry. Maybe it fit, maybe it wouldn't.